and um, we're going to be looking at the uh, life of John, the, actually the end of the life of John the Baptist. And we know that John the Baptist was sent as a herald, um, actually prophesied about in uh, the book of Malachi and um, uh, other places in the Old Testament that he, there was going to be a forerunner to the Messiah, to the Christ. And so John the Baptist is both his cousin and his forerunner. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard of the fame of Jesus. Now, um, this is Herod Antipatus, the son of Herod the Great. And um, there are um, at least three Herods that are mentioned in the New Testament. Um, there were more in history and Herod is more than um, just a name, but it is a title. And the, the line of the Herods actually come through the line of Esau. They are Edomites. So they don't like the Jews. They, uh, um, the Edomites um, desired to keep the Jews out of the promised land. And they hated the Jews. That, that spirit of Esau is upon them. In fact, um, when you study the, um, the second coming of Jesus Christ, after Christ um, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and then enters the temple to cleanse the temple, the next place he goes is Edom to cleanse Edom. And so uh, Herod is an Edomite, doesn't like the Jews, doesn't like John the Baptist, he doesn't like Christ. So Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show, show forth, forth themselves in him. Now, verses 1 and 2 take place after the account that Matthew's going to give us of the death of John the Baptist, all right? So in other words, Herod believes that John the Baptist rose from the dead and that he is embodied in Jesus Christ, all right? So it's kind of a double whammy, all right, <laughs> as far as Herod's concerned. So verse number three now is going to tell us the account of Herod and John the Baptist. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Okay, so here Herod um, has literally stolen his brother's wife. So he's married to his sister-in-law. Okay, and um, John, in verse 4, said to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. Okay, so he says, you know what, Herod, you call yourself a Jew, and yet you don't live by the laws. All right, and verse 5, and when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So Herod is afraid of John the Baptist. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, now this gal's name is Salome. She's the daughter of Herodias, and she danced before them, and it pleased Herod. In other words, Herod was, um, he's in a, an erotic state because of the dance of this girl. And so, with all of his blood gone out of his brain, he says, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. Whatever you want, I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. And she, being before instructed of her mother, in other words, Herodias told her what to ask. She said, you dance in front of Herod, he's going to get excited, he's going to say, I want to give you a great gift, what do you want? So she says, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was sorry. 
nevertheless for the oath's sake. And them who sat dining with him, he commanded to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. Now, can you imagine, you know, what kind of people these are? You know, can you imagine giving to your teenage daughter, having some soldier give your teenage daughter a platter with a, with a severed head on it, okay? And she has, it doesn't even upset her. It doesn't say she was crying or weeping or that she feared or anything. She just takes it and she gives it to her mother. And so these are really evil people. Verse 12, And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed from there by boat into a desert place privately. And when the people had heard of it, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now late. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give them to eat. And they said unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He says, Bring them here to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men besides women and children. Okay, so let's break this down just a little bit. Verse 14 says that Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion. That word compassion that is used there comes from the same word that we get our term spleen. It's splechna. And it literally means to have your insides moved. And so Jesus feels his insides as they're moved toward the multitude. And he heals their sick. Okay? Go ahead, Pat. Well, all these fish, you know, I mean, do they, do they, did they cook them? Or we'll they... get there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Okay? okay? All right. So this multitude is around Jesus. Jesus is healing the sick that comes to them. And it's getting toward evening, and the people are hungry. Back in these days, there aren't Arby's and McDonald's and different places where there's not a Culver's close by. I doubt, I doubt there wasn't no McDonald's. <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. So anyway, uh, and, there, this, and the scripture says they're in this desert place. It literally means it's a wilderness place, and it's late. And it's too late to send the people away. It's like, you know, how many of you ever gone to a conference, all right? And um, 11.30 comes around and they say, okay, uh, break. we'll take a little break now. Everybody can just go do what they want to. And then come back at 1.30, you know, and we'll pick up again. Well, it's too late to do that, all right? It's going to be dark. And they don't have street lights. Probably a lot of these people didn't have any kind of torches with them, you know, that type of thing. So they were used to moving while the light is still up, all right? And, and um, th this account is found also in Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them give just a little bit different slant on it. Um, when, you, when you read the account in John, um, Jesus asks Philip, you know, um, uh, Philip actually says, well, where are we going to get food, okay? And uh, some people think the reason Philip asked that question was because um, Philip had been the accountant for mm -hmm. Zebedee, the father of, of James and John, um, who had, a, who had a, 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 a fishing business. And we understand from the book of Acts that Peter wasn't, intelligent, wasn't an intelligent man, according to 
um, the educational system at that point in time. Remember when James, when when Peter and John meet the man at the gate, beautiful, and he gets healed. The Sanhedrin called them in, and they said, you know, well these are unlearned and untrained men. In other words, they weren't highly educated and they didn't know their letters. From that scripture, we can we can assume that Peter didn't know how to read. Mm -hmm. So when you read First and Second Peter, that's written by somebody else. In fact, the book of Mark is the sermons of Peter written by John Mark. Okay, because Peter's out there preaching the gospel, and John Mark is recording for him. Okay, so um, so Peter wasn't a, a highly intelligent man. So you know. But Philip says, well, how are we going to feed these? Where are we going to get it? We're going to get all this food. And, and so uh, Jesus says to his disciples, they need not depart. Give them something to eat. So evidently the disciples go out through this multitude and, and uh, we, we pick up on the story in the other gospels that this little boy comes forward. And he evidently has a basket, and in this basket, he has five loaves and two fishes. Now, if you're familiar with this culture, their bread has a hard outside and a soft inside, okay? So in many of these, of these cultures, they break the bread open, they pull the inside bread out, eat it, and usually cast the crust away, all right? We don't know exactly what kind of bread this was, but it, it's it's possible that that's the kind of bread that this is, okay? So they're not making sandwiches. I heard a guy one time <coughs> preach an entire sermon on God, on Jesus, giving these people, you know, fish sandwiches. Well, it's not fish sandwiches, okay? And remember now, they don't have refrigeration. It's hot. So how is it that they preserve things? They salted their fish. Okay, so these would have been a hard type of fish, all right? Probably in our culture, if, you're, if you have understanding of hard fish, it would have been something like lutefisk. Lutefisk used to come hard and then you'd have to soak it. Well, this wouldn't be quite that hard, but it would be almost like uh, eating um, jerky, all right? You'd break it off and, and eat it. Um, sometimes the bones actually become so soft that you can eat those. Um, it could have been as soft as a smoked fish, but that wasn't common in this culture. So, so it's it's most often assumed that these were um, these were some sort of a salted fish that hung out in the sun and had been dried and and were being eaten. And so. Jesus says, um, bring them to me, okay? In other words, bring this basket to me with these fish. Now, um, it, it's interesting. What happens now is that Jesus commands. The scripture is very, Matthew here is very direct. He says, Jesus commanded the multitude. He didn't just ask them to sit down. He said, all right, everybody find a place to sit. Let's, you know, let's get this show on the road. Um, you know, preachers can get that way sometimes. They can get just a, um, <laughs> I had a guy on Monday get up and walk out of class, okay? And uh, it was just, it was a simple thing. Uh, he wanted to ask a question that wasn't really pertinent to the subject. And I said, I don't have the answer right now, but I can get it for you later. And he wouldn't sit there and listen to that, so he just packs up his bags and he walks out, okay? And uh, later on, I was talking to one of my colleagues, and I said, uh, you know, I said, uh, I, uh, he wouldn't listen. And he says, well, you have to understand about drug addicts. He says, they don't like authority. And he says, he says I can tell you this, I can tell you one thing about you, Pastor Dan, that you see, you're very soft spoken, but when somebody, you know, when somebody starts to mess around, you get very direct, and that threatens them. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, Jesus got very direct 
He said, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's interesting here is that Matthew brings out something that was very common in these days. He says that it was approximately 5,000 men. And in verse 21, he says, besides mm -hmm. the women and children. So you have to figure that there were 5,000 guys here. That doesn't count the women, all right? We have no idea how many of these men were married. But being in a Jewish culture, most of them were probably married and and there, there were probably kids around so let, let's say there's let's say just for ease of, of math okay that every per, every man that was there had a wife okay and you can say well but some guys aren't married that's true and there were probably some single women there too mm -hmm. so let's just say it balances out all right and that each family had a child all right so easily we're talking we're talking about fifteen thousand people or more that they're at this dinner, okay? Now, you've often wondered, some of you ladies that are here, you've often wondered if you made enough. Okay, how would you like to face 15,000 people with, with two salty fish and five loaves, okay? So, what does Jesus do? It says he blessed and broke them. Where else does Jesus break bread? At the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So why do you suppose Jesus broke the bread? Sure. To share it? Okay, it's a, si it's a sign of sharing, all right? It's a sign of humility, okay? Um, he's, he's, he's bowing before the Father. He blesses it, and he gives the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the multitude. All right. Now, here's what's important about this. They did all eat, so everybody ate and were filled. Now, if it's real salty fish, it wouldn't take my wife very long to get full. <laughs> Me, I could eat more of it. Okay, but Rita's not into salty fish. Okay, so whatever your filling is, I, you know, some can eat two, and you know. I bought, I bought a ham for Easter, you know, and I said to the lady, you know, she said, how many people are coming? I said, 11, and she says, do you want to have some extras? And I said, yes. She said, do you want to have some leftover? And I said, yes, okay, so she figured, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how she figured it, but she thought an eight to 10 pound ham would be enough and it would give me some leftovers, okay? So I don't know, I don't know how God figures this out, all right? But anyway, I guess if, if, if somebody can know the number of hairs on your head, he can figure out how many fish to, okay? Amen. I think so. So anyway, the disciples, they go out throughout the, they go out through the multitude. Now, there's, now this is taking a while, okay? Because how many disciples are there? Twelve. There's 12 disciples, okay? And they're going out amongst 15,000 people. You know, and so it's it's going to take a while, all right? And everybody's eating, and and when it's all over with, they pick up. And I want to know where they got the 12 baskets. That's the thing that really <laughs> interests me, because they had one basket in the beginning, and suddenly they've got 12 baskets of leftovers, okay? Scripture doesn't really say what they did with the leftovers, but... Um, we are told in the Gospels that um, there were 12 baskets left over. In fact, Matthew brings that out. He says, and that remained 12 baskets full. Why do you suppose Matthew records the number of leftover baskets? Why did he just say there's a, there were some leftovers? I've heard many different theories on this one. Well, give me one. One of them is it was one for each of them to pick up. One for each of them to pick up? For faith. Okay. So Matthew, was a, Matthew had been a tax collector, so he was used to numbers. He was used to numbers. Okay. What else? Rita said for each one of them to eat. For Maybe the disciples had not eaten yet. Okay, for each one of the disciples to eat. Okay. I'll give you my opinion, all right? 
In Scripture, 12 represents divine government. Mm -hmm. There are 12 apostles. There were 12 sons of Jacob, which make the 12 tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. okay? And so 12 in Scripture represents divine government. I'm, I believe that what is being taught here is that God has control over everything. And that we live under his governmental control, not our governmental control. Because if it was us, we'd be saying, if it was our house, okay, and there were 15,000 people coming for dinner, don't you think <laughs> there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth? <laughs> Rita would be wailing and I'd be gnashing teeth. <laughs> you know, how am I going to pay for this, okay? But, but Jesus wasn't, you know, Jesus wasn't concerned about how it was going to be paid for. He wasn't concerned about where it was going to come from. He just believes. And, you know, um, I, there have been times that, you know, we have thought, boy, this isn't very much. And yet when it was all over with, everybody was full. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I think we've all had those, those times, you know, where we've said, God, can you stretch this? Okay, and uh, he does it. I I'm just going to, does anybody have anything they want to say? I have a question I want to ask you. Sure. Personal opinion. Sure. What do you think it looked like? Do you think, I saw, I remember an old movie, I don't know if it was Jesus of Nazareth, one of those movies, where they kept just reaching in the, buck, in the basket and pulling fish out? Uh-huh. Or did he, like, break the fish and would just keep, you know, like, what do you think it looked like, in your opinion? Well, you know, I cuz that's the part of the story that I can't right, figure out where did right. it all come from. Yeah. I I don't think that Jesus broke the fish and broke the bread and suddenly there were thousands of baskets. Right. Somehow these guys camp with baskets and somehow the there was enough to go into the baskets and I think it was like the cruise of oil. Remember? Yeah. Okay, the woman who was making her last supper for her and her son. And the prophet said, you know, bring me every container that you can bring, mm -hmm. okay? And she had one container with oil, but she filled many containers. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can see that happening. She just kept pouring and then she kept put it pouring. back down and it was full again. Yeah, again. so, okay, mm -hmm. so let me say this. I don't think the disciples went out and passed everything out found 12 empty baskets and went out and filled them up. Right. I think that, that right. they kept giving, the baskets kept being filled, and when they were done, their baskets were still full. Yeah. 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 I think that's how it happened. One night, I don't even remember now where it was that we were, but uh, we went to see a guy by the name of Mike Cole, minister. It was here in Minnesota someplace. Grand Forks. Well, he's from Grand Forks, but I don't think we went to Grand Forks to a meeting. Maybe it was Grand Forks. I don't know. He pastors a church in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I used to tell people that my brother was coming to minister, okay? Cool. And Mike, Mike is a black man. <laughs> 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 All right, so people are always looking out, where's Pastor Dan's brother, you know? <laughs> Okay, so um, Mike calls me up and he says, I'd like you to come minister with me, you know, at this such and such a meeting. So I went to this meeting, and um, while I was praying for this guy, God gave me a vision. And here's what I saw. I saw that this man had a bag of grain, and he had a shovel, okay? And people were coming to him with their bags, okay? And he was filling their bags with grain. And, you know, they would leave and another person would come. And, 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 and as he was shoveling, okay, I saw this huge scoop that was, that was always putting new grain in the bag. So even though he was shoveling grain out, mm -hmm. the grain never went down, okay? It was always full, okay? And, and what God was saying, was, I, I looked at this man and I said, has God been speaking to you about giving? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what, what's been happening? And he says, well, 
he says, I've started giving. And he said, my bank account, nothing's happened to it. It just, it's always <coughs> full. You know, so I get, you know, I get something, I get a better job or um, he was in sales. I sell more, you know, and, and so when he said I get a better job, that means that for the company that he was selling for, he'd get these jobs that had a lot of work and had, you know, much more income. So his percentage was were higher, okay? And uh, he says, I just, you know, he says, I just can't spend it all. And I said, well, that's what God is saying. God is saying that as you scoop it out, he's, you know, as you, as you just take your shovel and shovel it out, he's scooping it back in. Okay? And I said, that's a principle that God's going to use in your life as long as you are obedient. See, the whole thing is obedience. Mm -hmm. If the disciples would have said, this is stupid, mm -hmm. and sat down the multitude, <laughs> We never would have had the story. <laughs> but the disciples had to move too. So there's God's part and there's our part, okay, in the whole thing. All right, now, verse number 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a boat and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain privately to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, this is interesting because in verse 15, the evening was coming. And now in 22, the evening has come. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're not, what, maybe from three in the afternoon to six or seven. Six or seven? Okay, so we're not talking about, you know, it's a long stretch of time. But there is a stretch of time here, and there's a lot that has taken place. I mean, it takes a long time to get 15,000 people to clear out. Mm -hmm. You know, so there, there's some time. There's a little bit of time here. Um, and when he, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went into the, a mountain privately to pray. And there's a lot that could be said about this, okay? That, you know, that Jesus prayed and then he went out and did things, mm -hmm. okay? He didn't do things and then pray. He didn't come up to a problem and pray about it. He was prayed up before he got there. Right. But when the boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary, and in the fourth watch of the night, okay? The fourth watch of the night, I'm trying to think, 3 to 6 a.m., the notes in my Bible say, okay? So, and this is, uh, help me, Cordell, this is Roman time, right? Yes. Yeah, the Romans used the watch. The day was divided into quarters and so was the night. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, th this, is, this, is a, 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 this is a Gentile way of keeping uh, track of things. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Notice Peter didn't say in the water. Let me come to you on the water, okay? Mm -hmm. Peter at least had enough faith to believe that Jesus could help him walk on the water, mm -hmm. okay? And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, this is interesting. Remember, this, the scripture says, Matthew says that the wind was contrary. All right. So in other words, there's a lot of waves going on. All right. I have an uncle that um, in in World War II fought in the islands, and uh, so um, he would he was on some of these troop boats, these sh troop ships, and you've seen these pictures of guys going down the the netting down the side of the boat, okay, the side of the ship, and getting into the ship below. All right. My uncle says that it's in the movies, you don't really get a good representation of what's taking place. Because he said those little ships 
those little boats are being tossed up and down so hard that if you come off that, if you don't time yourself getting off that net, you can literally break your legs from the ship, the boat coming up, okay? So here's Peter. The winds are contrary. On the Sea of Galilee, they would call these sometimes devil winds because there, were, there are no trees, okay? Mm -hmm. The wind comes down and it comes straight down off the cliffs like in North and South Dakota. And the wind, so rather than blowing across a lake like we have here in Minnesota, where the wind you know, is cut by the trees and then just blows across the lake, mm -hmm. it goes down and it causes the lake literally to come up, okay? So, <clears throat> so they're contrary. And it's, it's a pretty dangerous thing all right, to, to be doing. And, you know, I've often heard people laugh at Peter for his lack of faith, you know, and other things. I am going to say, I really do think that it is a picture of faith for Peter even to get out of this boat. Yep, amen. Okay? At least Peter does have the faith to get out of the boat because it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. So Jesus says to him, come. And Peter was come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous, this is a very dramatic term that's used here, boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, notice, the, the, notice the terminology here that Matthew uses. He caught him. Peter's sinking. All right? We've got a contrary sea. And so Jesus reaches out and he catches him. All right? And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, thou little faith, why did you doubt? And when they were come into the boat, the wind ceased. Now at another time, Jesus stands up in the boat and he says, peace be still. Mm -hmm. But this time he doesn't say anything. He just gets in the boat and the wind ceases. Then they were in the boat. Then they that were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying of truth, thou art the son of God. All right, so here again we have Christ exercising his authority I believe not just over nature, but over the devil himself. Because I believe, I believe wholeheartedly that this was a spiritual thing that we're seeing take place here. Yep. Where literally um, Peter desires to exercise faith, and the devil does what he can to destroy faith. And Jesus uses this as an illustration to say, as long as you keep your eyes on me, Amen. you're going to be able to do great things. You're going to supersede the natural. Amen. But God, you've got to keep your eyes on me. Now, there's there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of things that can be said here. Number one, okay, for miracles to happen, there has to be a reason for the miracle to happen. So for a super positive to take place, sometimes a super negative has to be taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? <clears throat> so it, you know, miracles cancel out the attack of the devil. Okay. All right? So I, 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 it, I, don't, I don't think we need to be a bit like Clint Eastwood, make my day, bring it on, you know? I, I don't think we need to do that. I think it's just going to come. Mm -hmm. Amen. These guys didn't do anything. They weren't doing anything wrong. I mean, they just fed 5,000 people. Jesus just prayed, you know, and this wind comes up, and it's boisterous, and it's cantankerous. And, and, they haven't, and, there, and there's going to be times we're going to go through life, and we're not, we haven't done anything wrong, and something's going to come up, okay? You know, and that's when we need Christ. You know, if we've done something to create the chaos then I believe that we need to understand this is the consequence of what takes place, you know, if I've been disobedient. But if I haven't been disobedient, I don't really have any lesson to learn except keep your faith in Christ. Yep. 
you know, it, it, just like in the, in the seven letters to the seven churches, to he who overcomes, I will give. You know, and there's all these promises about, you know, to, to him who overcomes, okay? And, and so I, I believe that that's, that's what we're seeing here, is just another one of these overcoming promises to things that happen to us when we are innocent and, and going away. You know, I look at Larry tonight, and I remember, how long ago was it, Larry, that you broke your, you got out of that truck and you broke your hip? Two years in December, okay? And God performed some real miracles for you during that time, didn't he? Yeah. What did you say, Jessica? I was thinking about that. When you said, Bob, uh, there's got to be something yeah. for a miracle to take place. Yeah. Yeah. Miracles don't just happen. Miracles supersede the attack. That's right. There's a reason for it. Yeah, there's a reason for it. <clears throat> Yeah, and we don't like it, do we? I mean, I can't say that I've ever liked any, anything that came my way that required a miracle. Okay? Hard, yeah, it's, it's hard, but... Um, yeah, the truth is that, that, that God will help us to overcome if we will keep our faith in Him. All right, verse number 34. Were you going to say something, Eric? Mm, nice okay, all right. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. And he bes and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly well. Now, this, this portion of Scripture is hardly ever preached on. What portion of Scripture is preached on about the hem of his garment? The lady with the issue of blood. The lady with the issue of blood, okay? That broke through the crowd, and Jesus said, Who touched me, for I have sensed that virtue has flown out of me, okay? But here is another place in which they have touched the hem of his garment. Now... I have a question. What do they mean by the hem of his garment? <laughs> his prayer shawl. That's right. The blessing knots. So, huh? The blessing knot. The, the titsits. The blessing knot. The titsits. Yeah. So here we see that Jesus is is uh, he's dressed like a Jew. Okay. And, the, and most pictures of of Jesus <laughs> that we see must be painted by Gentiles. Because they, they don't have the they don't have the prayer shawl. No. And they're you know? bending down to the ground to touch the hem And of they're his bending garment. down to touch the hem of his garment. I mean, that's the way, you know, that's the way I was taught as a kid. To me, mostly like in a Roman toga, if you really think about it, you know, with a piece of material that goes this way. Well he had yeah, a he know. had a garment that was seamless. Well, I mean, in the pictures that we see yeah, of Jesus, yeah, it looks like yeah. a Roman toga. A Roman, yeah, and it went down to his feet, yeah. you know. So, yeah, so he was covered, mm -hmm. right? But this is this is actually his prayer shawl that he has over him. And so we know that he's a keeper of the law, all right? He's, when you see him, he looks like a Jew, mm -hmm. all right? Whatever a Jew looks like, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, so, but I like this they touched if they could only touch the hem of his garment as many as touched were made perfectly well wow. praise God they were made whole alright any questions or thoughts or ideas tonight nothing Okay. Oh, that fish, uh, Spirit God, how he pulled. Just, you remember you were telling about the fish this morning, you know, that he pulled or just uncooked fish. Or uh -huh. just, what did you believe? What's that? Some way you're boiling. Salted. Salted and dried in the sun. Yeah, salted. Really? You've never seen them dry fish in the sun? No. Oh, yeah. I've it's heard once, too, that it's almost like oh, sardines. Uh, like how you could, like Well, sardines would be oiled. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or uh, preserved. Preserved, you're right, yeah. Could be sardine More right. like anchovies. Yeah. Well, salted. 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 Salted, put, sardine? salted and put out in the sun. Yeah, I've heard the, the five loaves. Yeah. The, pro the difference is, though, that sardines are packed in oil or oil. water so oil. that they're softer and they're, they're wet, mushy. Mm. These would be dried. Yeah. Dried. Yeah. Get in your head dried. Like Looks like your sweater. Well, there's, there's other countries where they'll actually hang them on a rack. So yeah. They do that on Red Lake. The Indians, yeah, yeah. the Indians salt and and preserve walleye that way. Did they have time to do all that though? Sure. They didn't have TV or radio. Yeah. Where are they? Where are they going? They weren't like you, Larry, getting your truck and drive two hundred <laughs> miles a day. <laughs> you know. Whatever that. Two hundred miles. It took them a long time to get two hundred miles. You know. So yeah, no. They yeah, they had time. They. Whatever that fish was, he just multiplied the same kind. Right. Right. Remember, most of these people now are in an agricultural type society. So that's just what they do. You know, my grand my grandfathers had time to do a lot of things that I don't think of doing. You know, but that was, you know, they would they would go out in the mornings and and do their chores and then you know take care of the guard and then in the afternoon they could, you know, do whatever needed to be done. Uh, my grandpa Cole cut enough lumber to build himself a barn and build barns for most of his neighbors, you know. So, yeah, just ran a sawmill, you know. So, they, uh, yeah, they were, they were workers. They, they weren't like we are. We're soft. We are really soft when it comes right down to it, you know. We don't work like people used to. The